Ten years from now, after the Netflix reboot of Avatar The Last Airbender has come and gone, we will look back upon this time with one of two reactions. Either we'll think ourselves silly for having been worried about the reboot because it will have been fantastic, translating the show immaculately into live action and introducing it to a new and wider audience, or we'll think ourselves silly for having been excited about the reboot in the first place because it'll have been a complete bloated disaster. Until it releases, it's basically Schrodinger's cat. There's been a lot of speculation on both sides. Yes, there likely has been more excitement than anxiety over the entire Avatar fandom, but because the internet is a magnet for negativity, I have seen quite a bit of skepticism. One does not have to go far to find pockets of anxiety and doubt. I don't like being negative unless I'm given reason to be, and on the whole, I am optimistic about this new show. But because I already compiled a list of the top 10 ways the show could be better than the original, in this video I am going to illustrate my concerns with the reboot. Number 10. Television CGI Budgets Up until very recently, television budgets have been relatively low. A show might pay a lot of money to actors and other creative personnel, but not a lot of money is spent in the overall production. That was one of the big selling points the movies had. Sure, you might have to go out of your house and pay a lot of money for a movie ticket, studio execs might say, but the effects on these movies are like nothing you can see anywhere else. That has changed somewhat, mostly due to the success of Game of Thrones, but it's still difficult for live-action television shows to have sequences as beautiful and exquisitely intricate as those in the original Avatar The Last Airbender. And I highly doubt the Netflix Avatar reboot is going to get a Game of Thrones-sized budget, at least in its first season. While we Avatar dorks may worship the franchise, to Netflix it is still an unproven property. They're worried about sinking an incredible amount of money into the series and then having it be a flop. If it does well, the budget may expand. Remember that even the first season of Game of Thrones had a relatively limited budget. There were fewer battle sequences than there were sequences of people talking. Far fewer. The first season of Avatar on Netflix may not have as many beautiful battle sequences as we might want. Number 9. How to translate the weirder parts of the show. Avatar is a weird show. I don't mean that as an insult. It's an ostensibly Eastern-inspired fantasy world but it has hippies and rednecks in it. Admittedly, these characters don't play as significant roles as the main cast does, but these characters are still there. This is a show that bases a major geographic locale on the Grand Canyon and bases a major fighting competition on WWE. It's a show that has in its final episode before the finale its main characters watching a play about themselves. This is easier to do in animation, which has an innate fluidity to it. The whole of the original Avatar is bright and energetic. The colors pop. Though the show never shies away from darker moments, it has on the whole a whimsical overtone to it, which makes it easier for we as the audience to accept the strange intrusions on the reality the show has hitherto established. In live action, the appearance of the hippies or the rednecks will clash more significantly. I'm not saying the live-action show should drop these characters entirely, but it will have to do more work in order to make these characters fit. I hope Mike DiMartino and Brian Konietzko realize this. Number 8. The difficulty of translating fight sequences. Avatar The Last Airbender has the best fight sequences of any television show I have ever seen. That is not hyperbole. One could, and I do not mean this as an affront to the show's fantastic writing, turn the sound off during the fight sequences and still enjoy them on a choreography level. Every movement is so precise and so vivid. I'm afraid that in live action, it will just turn into another martial arts show. Movements that seemed fluid and graceful in animation could seem stilted and awkward in live action. It's not that the characters' martial arts moves are impossible in live action. Each style of bending was based on a specific martial art in our world. It's that the Netflix reboot could easily fall into one of two traps. The first is having the martial arts feel too simplistic and unprofessional, and the second is the complete opposite. 
it would be too easy for the martial arts to feel too slick and too stylized. Again, what looks good in animation does not necessarily look good in live action. Number 7, the Netflix binge-watching syndrome. This is less a problem with the Avatar Netflix series in particular than a problem with Netflix series in general. Netflix shows are released all at once, instead of in the traditional model of releasing one episode a week. Is there anything inherently wrong with this? Well, no. It's not a release strategy I particularly like, as I love reading week by week, episode by episode discourse about a show, but it is not a strategy I loathe either. What I loathe is how many Netflix series seem built around this model. They're built for binge watching. It means they are extensively serialized to the point that the episodes no longer feel distinct. They are structured like extremely long movies. Episodes do not stand on their own. They exist to ferry a story from one point to the next. If the new Avatar were structured like this, it would be an absolutely profound disappointment. Of all the shows I would place in my top 20 of all time, Avatar is the most serialized, with the possible exception of Cowboy Bebop. Yes, its grand arcs are incredibly compelling, but it arrives at these grand arcs via strong individual episodes. A more serialized show would not have time for some of these show's most iconic episodes, such as Zuko Alone, The Tales of Ba Sing Se, The Beach, and The Southern Raiders. These are episodes that require viewers to slow down and savor what they have watched instead of rolling ahead to the next episode. Let's hope the new Avatar is as episodic as the old one. Number 6. No Aaron E. Haas. Exactly how much of Avatar's quality is because of Mike and Brian, and how much is because of Aaron E. Haas, the show's lead writer, is, to say the least, contentious. E. Haas's most ardent supporters argue for his importance because he was responsible for a lot of Zuko and Iroh's stories, as well as the idea to make Toph female. These are also people who tend to dislike The Legend of Korra, which Ahas was not involved in. I am quite ambivalent on this whole Ahas, Mike and Brian debate. Both sides are flawed, and both sides are capable of producing great art. I am not a fan of the internet tendency to exaggerate the rift between them. Both sides are relatively mild-mannered. This is not a rock star style feud. However, there was magic when Aaron Ahas worked with Mike and Brian, and it is unfortunate that Ahas will not be involved in the new Netflix Avatar series. This is not because he wasn't invited back or anything like that, but rather because he is working on his own show, The Dragon Prince. Aside from Mike and Brian, no one was more responsible for the success of the original show, and the Netflix show will have a hard time compensating for his absence. Number 5. Shot for Shot Syndrome, aka Disney Remake Syndrome. This is number 5 for me because I am not confident that it will happen, but if it does happen, it might completely sink the show for me. The central question of the series creation is, how do you make the transition from animation into live action? If you're smart and savvy, you evaluate exactly what are the strengths and weaknesses of the conversion. You take out a few things that work better in animation, and replace them with things that work better in live action. You make every element justify its existence. If a character or storyline adds nothing to the overall narrative and themes, cut it. Simple as that. Respect the original series, but do not worship it. Or you can do what Disney tends to do and keep every single shot from the original work. I dearly hope the Netflix reboot does not go down this route. As an optimist, I call this pandering to those who want the new show to be exactly like the old show. If I were a pessimist, I'd just call it laziness. This is not the same as adapting a book into a film. Literature and film are different mediums, so the result is destined to be somewhat different. Taking an animated show and changing as little as possible when you make it into a live action show just gives you the same thing, but with a duller color palette. If the new Avatar goes down this route, I don't see any reason why I would not just watch the old one again, instead of watching the new one. Number 4. The Burden of Audience Expectations There are two parts to this one. 
The first part is the other side of what I said in point five. While the show will be in trouble if it changes nothing, it will also be in trouble if it changes things not according to artistic merit, but according to fan demand. Now, I realize this might be a hard thing for fans to hear. I completely understand. I myself am a huge fan of the show. I would not be making this video if I weren't. And sometimes fan demands do align with artistic merit. For example, both fans and critics would agree that the Great Divide storyline should be scrapped. However, if a show took a fan favorite but peripheral character like June the Bounty Hunter and gave her an expanded role in the Netflix reboot without deepening her character, the show would get old fast. Another example would be if they amplified the more mimetic elements of Toph's personality while ignoring the vulnerability that grounds her character. The second part of this point is my concern that the creators will feel the need to include fan-favorite scenes even if they do not fit organically into the new story, thereby making the show feel more awkward and confused. I love the scene where Jet gets brainwashed, for instance, but I don't want the show to shoehorn it in during a weird part of the narrative just because fans expect it to see it. Number three, Netflix's short seasons. In part because of Netflix's release episodes in a bunch approach, its seasons tend to be shorter. Ahas is the Dragon Prince only has nine episodes per season. Netflix's flagship title, Stranger Things, only has eight per season. Voltron, the recently ended sci-fi series created by Lauren Montgomery and Joaquin Dos Santos, who were important writers on Korra, has four seasons that are just seven or six episodes apiece. Yes, the other four seasons of that show are 13 episodes apiece, and other Netflix shows like Orange is the New Black and House of Cards also have 13 episode seasons. However, even if the Netflix Avatar has 13 half-hour episodes per season, that still means cutting seven episodes out of each season, or else turning the show's three seasons into four, which would radically disrupt the show's fantastic structuring. I'd like to clarify that there is nothing inherently wrong with restructuring the narrative, but if it is restructured, I'd like it to be restructured because of deliberate artistic decision-making, not to compensate for shorter seasons. And even if the seasons are shortened, I hope it's only to 13 episodes and not to 8. Or they could make it 6 10-episode seasons and split every season of the original show into two seasons. Number 2. Animation is not live action. This may sound obvious, but the idea that animation is a fundamentally different medium from live action is one that Hollywood has trouble grasping. This is not to say that animation is better or worse than live action, only that it is not the same. Not at all. We talked tangentially about this in points 10, 9, and 8, but it's deserving of its own point. Animation tends to be more fluid and eye-catching but live action tends to feel more grounded and substantial. To put this in Avatar terminology, if animation is airbending or waterbending, live action is earthbending. When adapting a show like Avatar that makes the most of the medium of animation, one has two options. The first is to bend the medium of live action to be more like animation, which risks coming off as gimmicky. The other is to try to change the core of the show to make it more suitable for live action, which risks ruining what made the show great in the first place. This is an unenviable position to be in, which is why I am typically against converting animated art to live action as a matter of principle. But I think the show can succeed if it accepts that it cannot keep all the techniques used in the original series, but still tries to keep the emotional spirit evoked and created by those techniques. I think it can do it. I believe in Brian and Mike. Besides, one of Avatar's best assets is its match cuts, and those are things that work very well both in live action and in animation. Number one, lightning doesn't strike twice. Earlier this year, I came across someone saying that the best TV shows are special because they could not have been conceived at any other time or place. I don't think there's a sentiment I've come across this entire year which I agree with more fervently. All great art is at least some percent luck. We like to deny this, but it is the truth, especially when it comes to visual media, which is the result of a large team of people working together. 
The process of making a show this complex is like a machine, and if even one component is removed from the machine, it is not the same. Even if all the machine parts are the same, but time has passed, the result is not the same. Almost two decades have come and gone since Mike and Brian first pitched the show to Nickelodeon. By the time the Netflix show airs, a decade and a half will have passed since Avatar The Last Airbender first premiered in 2005. Do you have any idea what the cultural landscape was like in 2005? We were still riding the fantasy boom started by Harry Potter and the film adaptations of The Lord of the Rings. It was a fantasy goldmine. Netflix was still known as a DVD rental company. We were only several years past Spirited Away's monumental win at the Oscars, making Eastern-inspired animated fantasy somewhat mainstream in the West. The show perhaps would not have been the lightning bolt it was had it been released at any other time in history. And at the same time, it is impossible to imagine animated fantasy television storytelling without thinking of Avatar The Last Airbender. The animated Avatar was like nothing kids back then had ever seen before. The live-action Avatar will exist in a landscape created by the original show. Also, Mike and Brian are not young guys with something to prove anymore. They're not bringing a vision to life. They're updating a property they created during a radically different stage of their lives. None of this means the Netflix Avatar won't be great, but it is unlikely to be as groundbreaking and era-defining as the original show was. So thank you all for watching. If you liked what you saw today, don't forget to like and comment and subscribe. Donate to my Patreon if you can, and you want to see more content like this. Keep watching Avatar. It is a fantastic show. And be sure to watch the Netflix Avatar when it comes out. Also, tune in soon for the next Avatar Explained video. I swear it will be coming soon. Thank you all again. Adios, comrades.